there. Today on Take Two, I am talking to Dr. Sophie Taylor, who is somewhere outside of London, and we're going to talk about uh, skincare, cosmetics, and demystifying skincare products, all that sort of thing. So, Sophie, welcome to my lovely studio. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with a question that I think is uh, is probably common to most people, certainly my age uh, and probably younger. We hear competing advice. On the one hand, we hear um, you have to spend a lot of money on good product to have any impact on your skin. And then you hear other people saying you might as well put lard on your face for all the difference it makes. So as a medical doctor, I am going to trust you on the science. Tell me about the science of skincare products. Okay. So I think to understand the, the science of skin care products, we have to really look at the science of skin aging and how and how that works. Um, so generally, when we think about skin aging, we think about two things. We think about what we call extrinsic factors, which are things that are in our control. That's things like our diets, whether we smoke, how much alcohol we drink, and sometimes also our medical conditions. So if we are on any um, steroids, for example, or other medications that can affect our ability for our skin to uh, repair itself. And then in the other field of, of uh, skin aging, we have what we call intrinsic factors. So these are things that are specific to our DNA changes that we all go through as we age and we really don't have much of an ability to alter that process and it's a huge topic it, there are lots of different cells um, that contribute to those intrinsic factors um, a few of them for example we have things like loss of collagen as we age that's something that is uh, an aging process. It, it happens on a DNA level. And it's due to the fact that as we as we get older and our DNA becomes older, we can't turn over our cells as quickly as when we're young. Um, we also have things like elastin, which um, are responsible for the sort of the ability for our skin to, to recoil and to recover. Um, and as we get older, the network of elastin um, gradually breaks down. And that causes our skin to become much more lax. Um, and so there are products in the market that help with that. Going deeper into the skin and deeper into the layers, we also have loss of fat and displacement of fat. So in the skin and under the skin of the face, we have what we call fat pads. And as we get older, these move and slide and reduce in volume. And that's what that's what causes the appearance that we see when we see things like sunken cheeks and sagging skin. Um, and even on a on a level of, of bone of bone health, um, we now know, thanks to lots of recent research in this field, that the actual shape of the bones in our face change. So, for example, the orbits, which is the, the holes in the skull where our eyes are, they get larger. Um, and so you can imagine that on that level, if, if our bones are changing, if the fat's being displaced, if the cells in our skin aren't doing what they're supposed to do, there's really nothing that we can do, such as putting butter on, that's going to affect that process. <laughs> we need we need certain products to to slow that down and to give us some support. And that's really where the science of skincare comes from. It's it's um, targeting those processes individually to try and achieve. So so when when you describe so many things happening at a molecular and at a bone structure level, truly how much impact can you get with something that is externally applied, no matter how good the product? Yeah. So I think um, obviously products that are applied externally skincare, generally you're targeting um, the cells of the skin, the epidermis, the upper layers. Um, you're not going to affect things like bone structure and fat pads. That's more to do with um, aesthetic procedures where you're replacing volume and creating shapes that have been lost. Um, skincare itself generally does one of two things. You're either trying to target the cells to increase their turnover and produce more collagen and elastin, which you can't do on your own, or you're increasing protection against things that cause um, damage to skin externally. So things like UV radiation, um, in particular, and free radicals, which are quite big at the moment, um, relating to things like pollution. Uh, and so generally, skincare will either protect you from environmental factors, or it will encourage your skin to recover some of its function that's been lost due to aging. 
Okay. There was a, a, a very recent story here in the news that um, anecdotally spoke to a number of plastic surgeons in, uh, in Vancouver, and they said that they had seen quite a market increase at uptick in clientele because people were coming in saying, I don't like the way I look on Zoom. Yes. <laughs> what, do you make of, what do you make of that? Um, that is certainly something that has been seen in the industry over the last few months. Um, it's a shame because a lot of the conferences that I've, attend that I've attended are obviously on Zoom as well. And, and the Zoom effect has come up and uh, it's difficult because I think there's so much less room for distraction at the moment. We're all indoors. Everything we do when we're talking to other people is obviously on Zoom. And I think that because of that, some people have become a lot more critical of themselves, which is a real shame. Um, and certainly that has been reflected in the popularity of aesthetic procedures and into sale of skincare, for example. Um, so it's definitely a real effect. I think it's something that will probably be seen for the next few years, especially as over in the UK things start to open and services become available again, especially personal care services. I think there will be a huge increase in those. So uh, kudos to you, I, I think, for opening that kind of a personal service business in the middle of a pandemic. And I think you you started and then everything was shut down. And, and so now you're waiting to reopen again. Tell me a little bit about your approach. I know that you were you were playing around with the notion of being a conscientious injector, uh, as in, you know, refusing to do the kind of crazy things that we see people doing, the gigantic lips and the gigantic. So tell me a bit about your kind of your personal philosophy about those procedures. Yeah, of course. So I think, firstly, going back to deciding to go into this industry, I was actually quite torn. Um, on one hand, I'm quite a creative person, and I really enjoy speaking to people and, and spending time with people and making them feel better about themselves. So aesthetics is a way of doing that. But then on the other hand, it can have quite a bad reputation in the industry, especially when we see articles of really young people young celebrities, role models, or people who are seen as role models to young women and young men, um, undergoing procedures and, and changing the way they look so drastically um, that it, it, it really is um, quite sort of disheartening to see sometimes. And I think because the industry is so associated with that, I personally struggled with coming to terms with now going into that industry and being associated with that. Um, so right from the beginning, I, I wanted to sort of set myself apart and make it really clear that um, whilst I completely respect everyone's opinions with regards to what's beautiful and what isn't, I think we all have our own beauty ideals and there are these beauty idols that are pushed onto us by the media and I wanted to be separate from that. So um, that sort of, I had to take a look at things like my marketing. So things like choosing images for web for my website. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was inclusive of um, older women, of women of colour, um, and definitely not promoting pictures of people in their teens and 20s with really disproportionate features. Um, so I think I've done that, it took a while. Um, and then in addition to that, we have to really look at the responsibility of our social media. Um, so things on Instagram, for example, there's something that I've done recently that I think has been quite beneficial is that I've wanted to start an inspirational women sort of spotlight um, that draws in the fact that I'm quite creative and that I like to do a lot of drawing. So uh, something that I've done is I have chosen a woman um, in the uh, sort of acting industry for every decade of life. So 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and drawn them and I've been really careful to choose women who I think are naturally really beautiful who may or may not have had procedures done but who also represent women who are intelligent who have um, made many great achievements in the acting industry but also who are very charitable and women who I think are probably a better kind of role model for young women to look to as a way to show people that I'm not trying to encourage um, lots of young people to get procedures and look up to people who perhaps um, need to be a bit more responsible. Mm -hmm. People who are actually built out of out of spare parts rather than, than being themselves. You know what I really appreciate about your Instagram posts, even though um, 
a lot of them include product. What I've noticed is that a lot of those products are, as you say, preventative. So to try to prevent further damage to your skin as opposed to something that's artificial. Um, so I've really appreciated that you've taken that tack of look after yourself before you need someone to fix you. Is yeah. that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you have a client that comes to you and they're concerned about something to do with their appearance or about aging, um, really the best practice is to, to find out from that person how they look after their skin. And if they don't already have a good skincare routine in place, that's really the first place to start. Um, things like anti-wrinkle injections and dermal fillers should really be a last resort to a good skincare regime. And I think it's really important as a conscientious practitioner that you recognize that and that instead of going straight for the procedures, you actually take a step back and, and think about that person's skincare routine and whether or not they could start there and then move on to a procedure if they, if they need to or if they want to. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to ask you is in, in a nutshell, what would be the best advice you could give people that are concerned about their appearance in general, and their appearance with a focus on, on their, their skin? What would be the main advice you would give people? Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, that's a hard one. I would say um, definitely look at your what you're doing to your body. So um, are you drinking enough? Are you wearing sunscreen? Um, are you eating well? Are you smoking? Um, things like that that you could really change and make a huge difference. And then when it comes to skincare, I would say... I don't personally believe that you have to spend a lot of money to have a good skincare regime. I think as long as you have a routine with at least a bare minimum number of steps and you stick to the routine, I think that that is really beneficial. Um, there are certain types of products that I think everyone should use. Um, and generally it would be three things. So one would be uh, vitamin C, uh, which is really important. It's a powerful antioxidant um, and it really protects against free radical damage from um, pollution, for example. And that can be applied in the morning. Sunscreen, arguably, is the most important anti-aging measure anyone can have. So if you don't wear sunscreen, um, wear it. Even if you wear makeup that contains SPF, that is not enough. You need an actual separate sunscreen of minimum SPF 30. And you have to wear it all year round, not just summer. Um, and then lastly, I would definitely recommend looking into uh, a vitamin A product in the evening. Um, even though vitamin A is advertised as anti-aging, I think the earlier you introduce it into your routine, the better. So 20s, 30s, start using it. Um, and you'll really notice the difference as you get older into your 50s and 60s. Wonderful, Dr. Taylor. Thank you very much for that. That was really fun. And uh, hopefully that was enlightening for people. So thank you very much. And I wish you all the very, very best in, um, in your new business. And I hope you can reopen your doors soon. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.